Welcome to Building Astropad. I'm Matt Runge, co-founder and CEO at Astropad, and I'll be taking you behind the scenes at our company where we build software and hardware products for creative people. So if you're a creator interested in starting a business or creating your next big project, join us and let's learn together. Well, hi everyone, Matt here and here with Jake. Hey Matt, how are you doing? Good, good. So Jake is on is our firmware hardware team here at Astropad and has helped us with Luna. Has done all the firmware for the Lunas as well. And so today we wanted to talk about hardware and what it takes to get into hardware, how it's different than software, and just kind of an overall look at it, getting into prototyping and and how one would get started. So, well, Jake, how about a bit of background on you? Like how long have you been doing hardware? What's your experience? Sure. So my background is electrical engineering, and I've been working professionally for five years at an R&D company, major manufacturing, Fortune 500 company, medical and safety related products, and then two and a half years here at Astro. So I've been here quite a long time. Seems like it's just kind of flown by. Like you mentioned, uh, primarily leading Luna firmware hardware development. I agree. Hard to believe it's been two and a half years. And yeah, and so Giovanni and I, our background is in software. So when we originally got into hardware, there was a lot we didn't know. And so I want to go over a lot of that today. And so when I say hardware as well, I really mean what we're thinking of as hardware, consumer electronics, like something that's got some electronics to it. Because I guess hardware could be a lot of different things. It's a lot of things. And it's a very different world from what I originally came from too. Being in the medical and safety fields, consumer electronics is quite a bit different. Yes, yes, yes. You have to imagine the reliability and the, what is it, uh, not qualification. There's just a lot of regulatory things. Yeah, regulatory. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Regulatory. Yeah. A lot more regulatory. Yeah, consumer electronics being different. But if you're you're somebody that wants to play around with making your own consumer electronics, uh, this is the episode to listen listen to, to at least get your feet wet. There's a lot to it. So let's start with, so somebody coming from like a background of developing software, developing web apps, developing those sorts of things. What do you think are some of the biggest differences between that and developing hardware? Oh, man. There are so many because if you're a software developer, you might know, you know, software development isn't just like a single thing, right? There's there's multiple disciplines even within software. You've got AI, data, app development, like there's just so many. So hardware is is kind of similar and it depends on on what you want to talk about. For me, I primarily focus on firmware, which is most closely aligned with software. So I write a lot of C-based code. And more recently, as we've transitioned our apps at Astropad to to Windows, I've started writing some Rust-based drivers. But that's, I mean, that's only one aspect of what goes into it. There's also pure electronics and And that would be somebody like an electrical engineer sitting and actually designing a printed circuit board or PCB. And then the actual enclosure itself. So a mechanical engineer working closely maybe with a UI, UX person with experience in that area. So that's kind of at a high level, some of the the main differences that I would say. And we can dive down into any aspect of that that you'd like to just kind of. Yeah, no, we should. And even one thing, as you're saying, getting into this is that, you know, I didn't even realize what disciplines were involved and say, like, you're making all that consumer electronic and, and you hit, a, hit on a lot of them there. You know, you need the firmware, which, you know. Well, it depends on, if you have electronics that need to be like smart, you know. Yeah. Air yeah, quotes. But, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But generally for like most things you'd be doing, some kind of firmware The mechanical you mentioned, which would be the physical enclosure. And also, you know, if there's some part of it that like moves mechanically, of course, that needs to be done. The electrical you mentioned, like the circuit board. Usually there's a software component now too for a lot of consumer electronics as well that talks to it. Maybe an app or a web service that talks to it. And that's still weird to me. That's a relatively new development, I'd say, within the last five to seven years. That never used to be the case in hardware development. 
It used to be you you wrote whatever app you needed. Well, I should I say app. You wrote whatever code you needed, right. programmed it to to the device, and it just like it had to survive with whatever you shipped out the door. Yeah, no. But now, since you know, smart home devices and smart devices in general, everybody's expecting it to be connected, internet connected, be able to push firmware updates to it. The bar has been raised. Oh, very much so. <laughs> so there's that software component. And then there's the industrial design too, because there's the mechanical, like how it actually works. But then, I mean, you want to make it attractive and look nice. And, you know, that also gets the UX kind of as well you were talking about. So there's a lot of disciplines yeah. in making hardware. <laughs> there's a lot. And you're going to need multiple people. This is not the kind of skill set that like one person is going to be able to do all of well, that. Well, you know, it depends on the size of the project, right? If it's, I'll use keyboards as a good example. There's sure. a subreddit called mechanical keyboards. There's a lot of entrepreneurs on there that kind of fall into this category that we're talking about where okay, they're, yeah. they're making their own keyboards and they're like sourcing parts and keycaps from different areas around the world. And, you know, by yourself, that might be doable. There's a lot of open source code for it already. So maybe just making some customizations to do that. But anything beyond like a very simple human interface. You start getting into, like you mentioned, really complex requirements that have real world constraints. And that's where a lot of hardware development has issues. And that I think that's the most stark contrast between hardware development and software development. Yeah, the real world constraints. Yes, that have killed many a project. What would be an example of some of those? Real world constraints. Well, I mean, generally, I, and then I can give some, some more specifics, but generally you've got form factor. That's a big one, right? And that's driven by UI and user experience. How do you want it to look? How do you want it to feel? Does it need to be the size of a US quarter? Does it need to you know, fit into a certain enclosure? And then what kind of goes hand in hand with that is, is power. Yes, I was definitely thinking about power as a big one. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is this thing going to be connected to a power source? Is that power source a, a wall connection or is it connected directly to the computer? Because those, those are different you know, power delivery systems, so they have different design considerations. How much processing power do you need? Can you get away with doing you know, the bare, absolute bare minimum or do you need something, you know, a little bit beefier, something that might be in, say, an Apple Watch, right? The iWatch has an ARM Cortex-A processor. Most very small, low power processors are called microcontrollers, and they run typically an ARM Cortex-M series processor. It's much lower power. And then just location, you know, what kind of connectivity do you need? Do you need Wi-Fi? Do you need GPS? Do you need Bluetooth, right? All of those connections that you might want will depend heavily on location. Are you inside? Are you outside? Are you rural? Are you in an urban area? There's just so many considerations. <laughs> and unlike in software where you can say, well, just add more RAM to your system, just get a more powerful CPU, in a hardware product that you ship, those are fixed at the time of the design. Yeah. And the other factor too that comes into that is you're like, oh, well, why don't we get a more powerful chip to put into, into the unit? Well, maybe that uh. takes <laughs> cost, cost. Absolutely. Maybe it costs way more. Maybe it's hard to get your hands on those chips. Maybe it's a really new thing that's just been released. And well, frankly, if you're not Apple or Samsung or you know another major company, well, you're not going to get first pick at supplies, at components. And then you were mentioning earlier is like the energy consumption as well too. It's like, well, does it need to run off battery? How long does it need to run? And then, okay, we get a more powerful chip in there and okay, well, we solved one problem, but now we're, now our battery doesn't last very long, you know? So there's all, all these, all these constraints and expense being a, a big one. I know one project we explored, we wanted to add Wi-Fi and ran into a real hurdle with that just because of how expensive getting like kind of off the shelf Wi-Fi components that you can use the high speed, I should say high speed Wi-Fi component. Yeah. Maybe, we, maybe we should clarify a little bit by add Wi-Fi just so people understand the way Luna currently operates is we use the Wi-Fi internally to your PC or Mac. The actual Luna unit is 
just there to look like a monitor. So we were experimenting with adding Wi-Fi to that to kind of cut out some of the processing time on that. Yeah, and could we create kind of a more a local network that was less subject to interference? But we quickly ran into cost problems and size problems as well. All of a sudden, it was going to be much bigger. Yeah, powerful Wi-Fi antennas take space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so it gets it gets really complicated really quickly. You know, and there's other things too that like lead times, right? Like I think that's that's a big one that component lead times. As somebody coming from the software world, I feel like when we've dabbled in hardware, a lot of times the overall process isn't radically different, but it just takes so much longer because you have to order components, you have to, you know, manufacture or prototype something, get that, test it, do it again. You know, it's it's like Instead of being on a computer where you can just hit compile and run, you know, you're looking at a months long process. Yeah. I guess I'm curious to see what your opinion was that. Were you, were you shocked when you first kind of learned about that or? You know, I knew it, like I knew it ahead of time, but somehow there's a difference between knowing the fact that hardware takes longer like that and actually going through the experience yeah. and being like, oh, well, can't we just like change this thing on the board and then do that and order this component. And then it's like, well, yeah, we can, but then we got to yeah. do components yeah. then we got to respin boards. Then we got to, so it's one, it's one thing to know conceptually. It's the other thing to kind of work, work through it, live through it and, and really get it. That's actually something we're kind of going through right now. Right. Especially with the state of the world that it's at, whether it be like taxes or supply chain issues those lead times on key components that go into the product have really gone up. And I think we're sitting at a minimum of three months right now to get certain key components into our product. So even if we ordered everything today, it would be three months before those were, those are in our hand. And that's, that's what we mean by lead times is how long from when you order to when you have a component in your hand. What's that? What's that time period? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess what we're talking about here as well, too, we're really talking about the, you know, the manufacturing that goes into the, the final, the final product itself. But there's a lot of steps leading up to that, which yeah. we should talk about. Do we want to just take, I suppose, the HDMI unit as an example? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a great example because we just, the Kickstarter just went out about a week ago for that. So that'd be a great example to use with how, and a good example too, like how we've done it, how we've prototyped things and how somebody new that's getting into it, how they could as well. So yeah. So where do we start with HDMI? Where did we start with it? That's a great question. It's been a, it's been a year and a half. <laughs> I should give some context too as well. So we have our, one of our main products, Luna Display, that's a hardware product and turns the, allows you to turn the iPad or another Mac into a second display and we're introducing PC support. And one of the key things with PC support is we need a new connector type. We've had mini display port, we've had USB-C, but one connector type that's incredibly popular on a lot of PC laptops is HDMI. And so we needed to create a new form factor Luna that would work with HDMI that you could plug in and work with our Luna display software as well. So that's what we're talking about and where, and well, where did we start with? Yeah, it's been it's been about a year and a half. And where did we start with prototyping that? So started with our existing products, right? And like you mentioned, we've got the two existing ones, but at, at their core, they both use the DisplayPort protocol. So they were very similar. And HDMI was just kind of, it's similar because it's still display. There's a standardized communication and interface mechanism for most displays, but how say HDMI and DisplayPort implement those protocols is slightly different. So going back to our original products, really understanding what's going on internally with those, because I should mention you guys did hire an external contractor for the initial development. And then when I came on, I kind of finished it out. So that, that early like, display communication, I was a little bit fuzzy on and I had myself to go back through and kind of relearn what was going on. And once I understood what was going on there, I started looking for parallels in the HDMI world. So it's it's a bit of, I would say, reverse engineering, right? Just kind of 
plugging in displays, seeing what happens, researching, I mean, Wikipedia, you know, looking at Wikipedia entries for display port, for HDMI, for just monitors in general, and learning what technical terms that I need to search for. And once we found that, we pretty quickly realized that in order to do anything further, we were going to need some kind of custom interface that would allow us to send these commands through an HDMI connector. So what kind of prototypes do you like to have? You said there's three main prototypes you like to have. Yeah, the demo, which can be anything, right? It just needs to work. It needs to prove a concept. It doesn't have to be robust. It would just be something that I could show, say, you and Giovanni and say, hey, look, I think we can do this. Here's kind of what it would look like. So literally like duct tape and duct tape wires, like maybe some sparks (laughs) coming off of it, but don't worry about that. (laughs) Just show it's possible. Right, right. And then benchtop prototype. And that could be like a, a professionally done printed circuit board. It doesn't have to be in the smallest form factor or necessarily the form factor that you're going to manufacture it in, but it's it's probably going to have all the pieces that you want there and maybe a few extras that you want to experiment with. And then the final prototype, which is this is the closest to manufacturing that we're going to get. So we kind of skipped the demo, I would say, just because of how integrated HDMI is. If this was going to be a, like a standalone product, we probably could have taken a bunch of off-the-shelf components and hacked something together to get it going. But because we were connecting directly to PCs, we kind of merged demo and benchtop together. And we created what I call the HDMI sniffer board, I guess, <laughs> is the best name for it, because we were able to take an off-the-shelf development board that already has a bunch of components on it, has a bunch of software development kits for it, and plug it into our custom board. And what that allowed us to do is plug in an HDMI cable to it and actually see what was happening on those communication lines. And from there, I was able to kind of reverse engineer the things that we needed to do and then eventually start sending my own custom commands with that board. So this was kind of a Frankenstein board. Like we had some components from our existing Luna products and some HDMI specific components, right? Yeah, absolutely. And actually for pictures, I think that board that I'm talking about actually made it into the Kickstarter video. Oh yeah, we should totally link it in. Yeah, yeah we, we can pictures. link that in. Or I might have I might have a couple random ones sitting around too. I'll find a picture somewhere. So for the sake of people that want to dive into this for the first time, and in this case, we kind of skipped the demo board because we knew a little more what we were doing. Right. But let's say this was a totally new project and we were doing a demo. How would you go about it? What's your... What's your go-to resource for, for putting together, hacking together a demo? of uh, Hacking together a demo. A couple different websites right off the bat. SparkFun is a good one. It's kind of a hobbyist maker electronic site that has a bunch of different, I'll call them Lego equivalent. Oh, okay, <laughs> right? so, cool. You, yeah, you know, yeah. If you want to kind of build your own electronics, you don't necessarily want to put together a nine degree of freedom circuit board, but you want to be able to measure nine degrees of freedom with an accelerometer, gyro, and magnetometer, you can go buy that off the shelf, plug it into say something like an Arduino. And Arduino has a ton of libraries that just, they've been written by other people. So if you get a sensor that's supported, plug that into Arduino the right way, then you can just start processing that data in whatever way is useful to you. So do you use the components from SparkFun along with the Arduino? The SparkFun yeah. isn't like standalone? I mean, they make their own standalone stuff, but... You like to use them together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And SparkFun is mostly just a supplier. They have a really interesting model. It's hard to describe without actually seeing the site. It's more of a hobbyist site, but it's, gotcha. it's, a good, it's also good for prototyping just because things are ready there and good to go. And being that I focus primarily on firmware... I don't have to think a lot about, you know, how am I going to lay out this board to do this thing? I can just grab those and go. Another good site is uh, DigiKey. 
they're purely supply. They do have some like tutorial stuff, but they're mostly just supply chain. And they, they focus a lot on those early two stages of demo and benchtop prototyping. I don't think I've ever been part of a company that's actually used DigiKey for the final supply chain, just because they are primary, they're based in Minnesota actually, but their cost is usually a lot higher than what you can find or supply wherever you're being, wherever you're manufacturing. So in our case, we're manufacturing in China. It's just a lot easier to get the components over in China. But for the, for the initial run up, DigiKey is a good, good resource for finding just raw components, but those will be unassembled usually. And for the Arduino, how do you program the Arduino? What do you use to do that? And how does that connect in with SparkFun and the other components? So Arduino's got their own IDE and I'm always hesitant to recommend it. It's a great resource for people who are just getting into electronics or hardware development. But I find that people will quickly hit a wall if they're very passionate about this and they, and they do this and they really want to do this as their career. That will get you started. And I would say if you, if you stay with that for six months, you'll probably hit a wall eventually. And that's, that's mostly due to the IDE itself. And the reason I say that is if you're a software developer, you're used to something like Xcode or VS Code or Visual Studio. It's very rich. There's tons of debugging options. You can get super detailed stack traces when things go wrong. And Arduino just doesn't have any of that. I mean, they have a very basic serial output that you can print things to and that'll that'll get you pretty far but when you start getting into applications where you might need a lot of processing speed maybe not power but things need to be done quickly in a pseudo real-time experience arduino just doesn't cut it there's a lot of software overhead involved and the processors that Arduino dev kits typically have are older. It's not that they're bad, but they're just not not the cutting edge tech that something like Luno would have. Mm-hmm. And what do you program in? What language is used for Arduino? C or C++. I think oh, okay, the majority, yeah, the majority of the Arduino libraries are actually, and that's not even really true either because Arduino uses their own language that's based off of a language called wiring, but for most purposes, it's it's C, C++. Okay. Okay. But even though it's kind of a good way for beginners to get into hardware, it's still something you turn to when you want to quickly prototype something. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there was a factory appliance that we needed to run a couple tests on our Luna units in the factory. That was what I turned to is because all I, all I needed to really do was check a couple pins when it was plugged in, make sure they were okay. And then just turn on a green light, red light to tell the factory worker it was good or it was bad. So I definitely, I definitely turned to that when it's something quick and I would say non-essential. Mm-hmm. How about more powerful kind of single board computers like Raspberry, Raspberry Pi? Pi. Yeah. yeah. Funny you mentioned that. <laughs> I've actually, I've actually worked on one before. My previous life as yeah. an embedded Linux engineer, yes. Those, I would say, are probably going to be more familiar to somebody coming from a software background, right? It runs, they typically run standard Linux. There's a tool set called Yocto. It's not a distribution. It creates one for you. That's like their tagline <laughs> because people always call it the Yocto distribution. But Yocto is a set of tools that you can configure to output a Linux distribution for you and you can make it as minimal or bloated as you want. It's kind of completely customizable. And then that's for more like production stuff. You can definitely start prototyping on something like a Raspberry Pi and you can eventually, you can eventually move to a more custom solution. But for say demo and just kind of like stuff that's on the bench, Raspberry Pi is a great option for that. Maybe not with a graphic interface. Go command line if you want the real experience. Is there downsides to using something like a Raspberry Pi compared to an Arduino? 
Depends, right? <laughs> Depends on what your application is. If you're making a keyboard with a Raspberry Pi, I'd say that's a bit overkill because okay, they're kind of yeah. they're they're two different sure. worlds. Yeah. Or two different tools. One's a hammer, one's a wrench. You can use a wrench as a hammer, but it's not the most mm-hmm. effective tool for the job. Or maybe one's a hammer, one's a jackhammer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually that's better. <laughs> yeah. Better. They do the same thing, but one is way overpowered for digging a or busting up a small, you know, small area. Yeah. Okay. So the demo. So you've proved out a demo. You've programmed some stuff together. You've got some boards, right? With wires running between them. Looks kind of crazy. But it works. Right. At least to a certain degree. Yeah. And I guess to take it back, because you your your original question was like, how would I do this if I was, you know, if we didn't have that custom board? I probably would have taken an HDMI cable and sliced it open and grabbed the lines that I needed and then just connected them to an Arduino. Mm, okay. That's probably how I would have done it had I had no other resources. Yeah, pretty cool. Definitely hacking up a lot of stuff, cutting stuff oh, yeah. up and looking. Yeah, that, that's what's cool about this too. So, okay, I got the demo and now moving on to the benchtop prototype. So what's the difference between that? I would say for me, the benchtop prototype is done by somebody who has more experience than me in hardware layout. I do have experience in hardware layout and hardware layout is where you take that, you know, hacked up concept and you start ordering parts from say DigiKey or or wherever you want to get your parts from. And you start putting them onto an actual circuit board in a way that kind of touches on all the things we talked about before, whether that's power, size, interface, the electrical engineer that does that board layout is kind of taking all of those things into mind. Actually, regulatory too is another big part of, of board layout. And again, it doesn't have to be the absolute final form factor, right? But it can't be it can't be 10 times its size. Otherwise, you're not super confident that you'll be able to shrink it down to the actual size that you need. But in this case, it has pretty much the final chips and components we want to use, we would want to use. Right. And in our case, a, a few extras too, like just some things we were experimenting with. And we had a we threw out a couple ideas about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had this feature on it? But you know, that's like that's like a tertiary priority. And we're probably not going to get to it. But you know, throw it on the board. And if we use it, we use it. If we don't, we can always take it off later. It's always nicer to have extra things and not use them than it is to add something after the fact. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. And I know these two are typically bigger. And as you're saying, has more components on it, kind of extra things in there for debugging, right? Like so that we can inspect things and see how it's working compared to the final size, which may be really small and compact and harder to work with. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the debugging thing too, because that's one thing that will impact me personally as a firmware engineer, right? A lot of hardware engineers probably started a bit of a flame war, but a lot of hardware engineers like to condense as much as possible, as fast as possible, which is, which is great. That's their job, right? To eventually get to that final form factor. But during firmware development, I often have to have wires physically connected to that board. And if they are as small as possible right away, I struggle, (laughs) you know, just, just working with the board. If it's a super delicate interface that I have to constantly plug and unplug and plug and unplug, I'm going to break a lot of them. And I have done that in the past. Sometimes it's hard to get away from. Sometimes it just needs to be small, but if you can avoid it in that bench topping prototype stage, having a nice debugging interface will really be helpful to firmware engineers. Yeah, that's right. And that's another thing too, compared to the software world, things are a lot trickier to debug. Yeah, It's not that you can step into everything with a debugger. It's like, as you're saying, it's like literally wiring up things onto the board, using oscilloscope, using some kind of analyzer yeah. to look at the signals coming off of it. To be clear, like there is a debugger and we do have one. It costs, <laughs> the programmer slash debugger does cost quite a bit for Luna. The one I'm using, I think is $1,000. There are cheaper models, but 1000 is like the top tier model and gets you the most features. So it does have breakpoints, but it's limited. I think it's limited to three or four. So not a whole lot. Nope. And even when you do hit those breakpoints, because you're working on a real-time system, 
things still keep happening. So you could have timers still ticking off depending on how you set your debugging system up. You know, you could still have things firing off even though you've stopped execution. You'll get a good idea of where you're at, but like you mentioned, other tools are often required. Signal analyzers, protocol analyzers, oscilloscopes, that type of thing. Those start to add up in cost. Yeah, that's where it can really, the amount and variation of tools and different, or even the components too, compared to the software world where a lot of stuff is open source. You can download and just run it on your computer. You don't have to go out and buy a new computer each time you want to do some kind of different debugging, right? Like that's that's definitely different in the hardware world. So the benchtop prototype, and so you'd use that, right, to program the firmware. And then at what point do you go to the final form factor? I would say final form factor really depends on two things. Timeline, like how close are you to, to launching? Like, do you have a goal in mind that you're trying to get to? And then state of the firmware development, especially for Luna, the hardware was done very, very early on. And that's often the case for consumer electronic products, just because a lot of consumer electronics aren't that different underneath. There's always like that processing unit, the microcontroller, maybe you've got an accelerometer, a couple other things, you've got some a bit of storage on board. They're not too varied. So the, the hardware engineers that lay these out are very experienced with laying these out in whatever way you need them to be laid out. And it's a bit repetitive, which is honestly why I don't particularly enjoy doing it because it's a, it's a lot, it's very much a lot of attention to detail. So that's going to be done fairly early on. And then as a firmware developer is developing, they'll eventually hit a state where they go, okay, I've got most of what's on that bench top figured out, or I'm pretty confident that I can get figured out. And I've tested the interfaces so that I know electrically the things that the hardware engineer has laid out work. So as long as you don't change those connections and how things are wired up, I'm confident that it'll work. And that's kind of when you when you take that next step of, all right, now let's shrink it. Yeah. And something I forgot to ask earlier about the benchtop prototype, is that something that's typically put together by a company that specializes in doing boards and laying out or in placing components, or is that something that's often built in-house by yourself, like soldered together? Well, how much money do you have? (laughs) Because that, I mean, ultimately it can be anything, right? It depends a lot on size. So in Luna's case, especially with USB-C, it needs to be assembled elsewhere by a company that specializes in small electronics. But if it were something, say, like, what's a good example? Yeah, I'm not thinking of a lot of things off the top of my head because a a lot of modern electronics use such small components. Actually, let's go back to the keyboard example that I used earlier. Keyboards don't necessarily need the absolute smallest components because they're pretty bulky things. So depending on what parts you chose, you can probably assemble that board by hand. You still have to have the board manufactured in a special factory. And there are certainly ways to do it at home and do it yourself, but those involve some pretty unsafe chemicals. And I'm not going to recommend people do okay, that. So not advised. To not advised. Do your own circuit board. <laughs> it's doable, but I'm not advising it. <laughs> so something like, actually, I think SparkFun does have, or they did spin off their own circuit board fab. So I think they had one internally and they eventually spun it off. And I can't remember the name of it. Let me look it up and I'll... Yeah, yeah, we'll link to it. it Yeah, 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 we'll link to it. There are circuit fabs, circuit board manufacturers in the United States that you can, for fairly reasonable prices, say, here's my board. They do have like dimension restrictions and you can get, say, three or four of them for $200, which isn't that bad. As long as they're not super, super tiny components. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then the, the final prototype you're talking, of course, is, is definitely done like at a manufacturing facility, not... Ideally, unless you're still in that, that garage phase of like assembling everything by hand in your garage, unit by unit. Yeah. It's going to be manufactured in a, a professional 
assembly line. And then there'll be multiple rounds too, where like the first is you do hundred units. Say, yeah, okay, let's do hundred units. How do they look? Do they function? Do they work? Before scaling up to potentially thousands. Right. And actually a good thing to note between that pilot run and the final production run, you really need to take a look at regulatory. Honestly, you should probably be looking at regulatory, you know, as you go along this process, you don't want to wait until the very end. So you should have things in mind for your market. I'll take an extreme example of healthcare, right? HIPAA is, I mean, that's a huge regulatory hurdle. So if you're going through and making a medical product, that's something you're going to have to look very deeply into. For most standard consumer electronics, all you really need to pass are what are called emissions tests. So FCC is what it is in the United States, but there are regulatory bodies in Canada, European Union, and Japan, and most places, but those are the big four that I can think of off the top of my head. And what emissions tests are, there are two categories. There are what's called intentional radiators and non-intentional radiators. And those sound like scary terms, but all it means is, are you using a wireless signal intentionally or are you creating a wireless signal unintentionally? And there are different limits for how much you can produce. And the goal of that is so that you don't interfere with other electronics. So imagine if I had a, let's say a Bluetooth product and I didn't go through this test, didn't care about these tests, and I put this out into the world and I'm just pumping as much power as I can through that Bluetooth radio. Well, that's not really good because you could potentially interfere with say somebody's pacemaker or somebody's brake system if you're in a in a vehicle if you're unintentionally radiating too much power it can start to have impacts on other electronics the best example i can think of is if you're running say a microwave an older microwave or an older 2.4 gigahertz telephone and your Wi-Fi starts kind of like going intermittent if you're on a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi link, because those all use very similar frequencies. So they're they're kind of stepping on each other. Baby monitors too. I've yes, found, baby monitors. I've found, found in use that put my baby monitor near a computer and whoo, watch the Wi-Fi. Yeah, and those are those are those are more timid examples and there are definitely extreme cases of interference. So those regulations are in place and they are a good thing, but it's something to keep in mind that as you go through this process, you'll want to be de- designing for those regulations and they do cost money. To get the testing done, right? To get yeah. the yeah, to be certified. You know, and I'm going to try to dig up an article there was like an extreme example of Somebody had something in their home that was emitting and it was like interfering with electronics for like mm-hmm. almost an entire city block and they couldn't figure it out for a long time. Yeah. You know, amateur, like amateur radio is kind of a good, I mean, it's very technical, but if you want to learn more about like why interference is bad, amateur or ham radio is kind of a good knowledge base of, of why electronics interference is bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of handheld radios, which I won't name, that are very (laughs) much kind of ignoring these regulations. Yeah, another thing that, too, that if you're not used to working in hardware, that certainly sneaks up on you. You're like, oh, yeah, we need regulatory testing before we can ship these things if you want to. Especially somebody that's, say, like doing a Kickstarter, right? And they're raise money to the hardware through a Kickstarter. They don't have a ton of experience with it, getting ready to ship out their units. And then, oh, yeah, I need to have testing in the countries I'm shipping to. Yeah. And I think, I think Kickstarter is actually getting a little bit better about that. I noticed the other day they did have like, what's it take to ship a Kickstarter product. So I don't know, I don't know how involved they're getting with that, but they must've had a, quite a few complaints earlier. Some I'll have to look into. Yeah. They're definitely getting a lot better resources out there. Yeah. That's actually another good note about Kickstarter and even say Shopify. If you, if you go to ship a product later, Web storefronts make it super easy to ship anywhere in the world. And just because they have that checkbox there does not mean you can, again, because of regulatory or even 
taxes or like there's a bunch of reasons. So before you go and like check those boxes to ship to all those countries, you got to make sure you're doing your due diligence to pass all the regulatory tests and pay all the fees. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot that goes into it. And this is why Kickstarter is such a great tool for launching a new hardware product, because there's a lot of costs that go into making something new like this. Well, any final suggestions or advice you'd give somebody that's venturing into the hardware space for the first time? Oh, man. Take stuff apart. <laughs> like, I mean, I got started taking computers apart, which is kind of stereotypical, I guess, for a lot of engineers. But even smaller, older electronics that might be broken or you're not using it anymore, you could start taking those apart, just kind of see what's in there and what an actual final form factor manufactured product would look like. It'll give you a good idea of like the eventual evolution of where you need to be. Yeah, Arduino and Raspberry Pi are great starting points if you have absolutely no experience in this, this kind of realm. Yeah, good to know. Good to know. Well, thanks, Jake. That was a pretty good intro through, you know, the high level of getting started with hardware. Yeah, thanks for sharing your knowledge today. Yeah, no problem.